so let's go to YouTube from before. So we're recording this. Let's see, but let's let's share for the remote team. We're not sharing yet, so let me go to OBS, not OBS, but let's go to Zoom. For a second floor install yesterday, yeah. weren't we? Yeah, we were trying to review it as well. See if I can uh, both record, continue, and share screen. Perfect. If it's perfect, but it's not. The bottom's are fairly heavy, yeah. And the height. Let's keep right, it so here. People, um, lifting over your head is considerably different, more difficult than lifting that baseline. So going from here to here. Is like really, really yeah, so take a look at this. Um, where we're so here, the, the second story walls are up. So, where are we between the first and second? That's roof, first floor walls, second story floor. That looks like it would be here. No, <coughs> no, not here. Installing corners, um, roof. Carport. You guys couldn't find it? First floor walls. Uh, we were thinking about basically. We were looking for it, but it's not. It should be between the. Uh, the what are you putting each other about? Yeah. 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 yeah, what happened to it here? Mm -hmm. uh, There's just the second floor and then. Side of house. Roof OSB. Roof. Rigid insulation. How is that uh, wood effect? Top plate. Well, I don't know that part. But it could be it could be just the I mean the, we could definitely do rope on the module to help the people on the ground. So you, you just wrap First the floor the thing on it and it could walk while Yeah, what happened to it? That would probably be as good as we get it. Uh, I've seen the Amish do some crazy stuff. With it vanished. Basic <laughs> and, uh, do you have it uh, on Yeah, I, I would have it on my... I would have it on my hard drive. Uh, I guess probably try to re-upload it. That was good. Um, what Grading. Roof OSB. So when No, it's. It's afterwards. So maybe just make sure it doesn't block back or anything. The, About the here. No, that starts right there already. Corners. Okay. No, it already starts. All right. Well, um, the way it was, so we had the life track there with the going up there next to this window. As soon as we had it up to about there, and people could get a good handle, like people were up there. As soon as the top of the wall module is like right there, you just pull it up over the edge. That's what happened. Um, and we actually, so here we replaced like all the siding because it's a little uneven colored, so <laughs> we fixed that. Um, well, I, I, I think so it would really help us to make sure we're thinking about the 
about this for other people? Oh, yeah. yeah, for other people, there's like a first principles thing. Like this is perhaps for more advanced builders. Probably a beginner builder may not want to do two stories, and builders generally want to avoid two stories because it's much harder on a body. So there's the one we started with, and um, our new our new compadre has come up with a really novel, I think, idea as well, where we create just a ramp, and then maybe we and then we put a rope on it. And just take two, you know, strong beef cakes and just pull it straight up the ramp. Up. Slide. Yeah. Can't be so no tabs. But it doesn't help yeah. with supporting it on the outside, though. It, the scaffolding should do that. You okay. bring it up, you yeah. set it where yeah, you know you feel it completely safe. You ease it yeah. out, and then the people in the scaffolding will be there just for support and, and hopefully not much more. Yeah. I just want to see the tractor on, but uh, <laughs> let me get sliding. Yeah, I got to put on the tractor as the approach. Yeah, I'm like different. this is uh, this is the permutations here, but Rosebud is number three right there. Fuck. Just t think about <laughs> four units. <laughs> okay, so this is four units of 256 square feet, and you can arrange them in about 30 or so different permutations, where each of them make a viable kind of a house. Like here's a two-story tower, which is our deal right there. You can have like a courtyard structure in the middle. You have a long house. You can have, I mean, the standard ones would be like, um, oh yeah, so this is Aspen. This is the one we actually started with. Two on a first floor, thousand square feet with a connecting walkway. That's really good for like, you know, comfort. Not good for thermal because you got so much exposed area. Like this would be good for Arizona, for example. Um, but it's a... Uh uh, a thousand square feet. Thousand square feet, but separated. Like 500, 500. 500 and 500. Perfect for in-laws. So, what's the difference between <laughs> this and that? Well, it, in real reality, the difference is about ten thousand dollars in cost, in materials cost, because all the cost goes into the roof and the foundation. Those are the expensive parts, and you got twice of that. So, this is. When we started, this was 32, this was like 45, and then the materials prices went up. So, I mean, it's a significant change in cost, but you want one floor simple to build. This is not going to be for your grandma to build, but a one story, it's, it's quite even possible, yeah, with a few people. So, um, that's the difference by design. Um, just to show, like, what did the how do these things look in terms of concept design just wanted to show uh, what well let's let's go to Aspen's we called that one Aspen so we started with designing that and then we said nah Aspen so yeah, this is so this is what we were gonna do. We we're actually planning it out like this. This this is uh, th that's our house there on the north part of the, the land. Uh, so we're like right here. So you drive around it, but we're looking at okay Aspen, and then you have greenhouse next to it and stuff like that. So we're, we're thinking about utilities. We're actually um, one cool thing to do is a gravity pond for energy storage. Mm -hmm. So a tiny, quite a tiny pond can get you like uh, like a qu tiny quarter acre pond it's like you get like 24 kilowatt hours like that's an equivalent of a huge huge battery bank you're pumping that with solar during the day you're doing hydropower at night apparently the two scalable forms of storage are compressed air and hydro compared to batteries batteries like forget about that you're not gonna do it with batteries um, they're too toxic these days, like especially lithium. Nickel iron, so like we have nickel iron in a set, just for perspective. When you look at the numbers, there's only enough for like a total, like I actually did the numbers, like is nickel and iron an abundant resource? Iron is, but there's not enough nickel. There's enough nickel for about one billion cars. Well, that's gonna run out pretty soon. So how do you do storage? Well, it's like gravity, compressed air, those are the scalable things. But before that, like Rocky Mountain Institute, 
Hey, Marie Lovins, they talk about, okay, efficiency is the number one thing. So design everything to be super efficient, like including the fridge that you can turn off at night, thermal storage that's seasonal, like big masses of rock or water that get you through the night or through the winter even, like that kind of stuff. And then all you need is like a few lights and a computer, you know, that's tiny batteries. So batteries are great for those cordless power tools, but I, don't, I wouldn't say they're great for cars. They're just too much mass in there. Did you look at the, the sodium uh, batteries that they were coming out with that Tesla just switched to? Uh, uh, ha haven't really, <laughs> but uh, let's see, do we have some? I just wanted to show like, if you look at building any of these models, let's see. Um, uh, Rose, so we went to Rosebud. Um, let's see what we have for Aspen. Oh, we're getting kind of distracted here, but anyway, you can do a lot of different permutations. But let's go over, uh, yeah, so I mean, we want to figure that out. Uh, for this simple owner builder, like you can start with a 500 square foot as well. You don't have to do the thousand. We're saying the thousand is relevant for a marketable model that looks like a colonial house. So that's the idea. And that's also very low cost, but you have the second story issue and that's not a joke. Um, you can do things like also the carport could help you if you build a carport first, you can build from top of the carport, which is a scaffolding, but that's only one side, but you can get your modules up there and uh, easier to work with. Um, so yeah, yeah. Let's go through the, the detail of the the build we've got the full details on the wall modules we've done like eight as far as the let and let's actually look at the videotape from yesterday a little bit a um, little bit more because actually if you look at the numbers from yesterday we got the so we got the live stream we've got the subfloor install things like this so we started with this with our scaffolding that's pretty cool um, any comments on that um, it needs to be affixed to the house in order to be perfectly, um, uh, you know, where it, it'll support good weight. Um, and yeah. we did that by just for to keep it a little bit lighter. Um, but yeah, it, it's good to go, and uh, it's been tested by. Uh, I don't know where we went. It, it's been tested, so it's going to be a little bit difficult to move around. But two people sliding it on that concrete works really, really well. Um, although we like it should the preference is to have it affixed to the house like especially when we're doing things like corners and stuff like that Yeah, scaffold yeah, just but to support the walls when they're up or to actually move them up? It's for humans to stand outside of the building and be able to work uh, outside. and then feel safe Okay, so once it's not to move them up once they're up it's to hold them in place Yeah, yeah. Uh, you could use, yeah for multiple uses yeah. If you want to screw it in the wall, right? Does he have all the designs documented now? It's for wall modules, isn't it? It's for two by wall modules, but um, <laughs> I think... Yeah, it's actually we use the interior modules from this house as our scaffolding right now. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, this is cool. So we put the supporting structure here because that cutout is not structural. All that weight is on the... Uh, before these, these two supporting walls, all the weight of that entire house section was between this joist and one 10 feet away. So now that's good so people can walk up there. And we start putting on the OSB, not the OSB, the plywood. That's great. I mean, two hours, 10 minutes with two and a half people to do it, the whole floor, that's pretty good. Uh, and then at the same time, actually, in a workshop, you guys did eight modules, which means 15 minutes per module. How many people were in on that? Like five or so? Four, four. Four, four people, yeah. So that's great. Uh, four people working at the same time so like if you take two people 30 minutes per module yeah that's around the, the time where it gets pretty efficient so I like it I like it um, but this when we did if you remember we did a mark down the very middle works great then you just put we started on this one right here just kept going right along to that mark seamless um, thing that we did on version 2 was put the sill gasket on the under on the 
on the joists so that you eliminate squeaking. The way they do it, industry standard, is typically you do glue. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine that that could be a little hard, right? Because one, once you put it on there, you're not taking it off. And two, where are you stepping? So you have to avoid the glue. And once you stick it on, uh, it's hard to move. You basically have to pry it up. So I think the sill gasket idea is a great thing. We don't know of anybody that does it. Everyone either glues it. Uh, we're not using tongue and groove plywood. We're using regular plywood. We did not use clips. Clips would go in between. Um, so between every single joist, you would have a clip to support that weak part. Not super critical now, very important in the years, like 10, 20 years when everything gets weaker and you need more support. Um, one comment about the screws, we use two inch screws. I would actually go a little longer, not that there's any issue right now, but once again, think 20, 50 years down, everything's gonna start getting loose. So the more grab you have, that may add like a few years to, to the point where the floor is absolutely solid. Other thing about the floor is I notice, and Evan brought this out, when we were up there prior to the floor, you can kind of shake it around, especially in the middle, because there is really no lateral support in the middle section. On the corners, they're quite solid, they're good, you've got a good connection there. Now after you put the plywood on, it's essentially as if you fix this entire beam to itself, like think of a cap on a jar, or something like a like this thing where it's kind of flexible right now but once you put the cap on it it becomes much less flexible that kind of a deal so that's what that's what the all the plywood up there looks like so right now i don't think you can really shake it if we just bounced around up there i think it's pretty solid right now and we we did like the proper screw schedule on that is six inch on the edges which is everywhere so the perimeter which is 100 feet of perimeter and every panel where you have an edge on a beam except for where you have the two foot spacing you can't get any screws in between there and in the field it's one foot that's the industry standard uh we did we did like one foot everywhere i try to get more around the corner where like especially the the very corners where just put like a whole bunch it just means more sod in case we get a sudden wind or something sudden storm where we we're not we did not use the clips this time. We uh, just avoided that. We just got the floor up. So um, let's go to the dock, it, the working dock itself. So where do you find it? Uh, too many links to keep track of. So take a look at Seed Home Three. But by the way, let's actually take a look at what we did on a micro house because the micro house is one of the 50 tools of the global village construction set it's a it's a living machine um, so micro house one page on the wiki you want to take a look at is genealogies has somebody seen this we've got a version backlog of all kinds of things so the micro house take a look at that oh man <coughs> earth bag hut start with that I mean you can study um, that's not what, it kind of looks like this but we start with the earth bag hut on the corner. That's yeah. That's I lived in there for like a few good years, <laughs> um, from 2006 to 2012, actually. Wow. Which one's the earth bag? Hut? It's the one, the earth bag. That's oh, that thing. <laughs> that's the cordwood. That's ver that's the two. We added that for our first intern. You got a living roof. Living roofs are awesome. Yeah. What we have on top there is uh, not on this one, but on the first one, black locust roundwood with rebar stakes through it. That's not coming down. That's gonna be there for the next 100 or 200 years. So, that's not the Sidika home yet. Then we built the original OSC workshop, the, the old one. Uh, it's CEBs, so that's the first CEB thing. And then Hab Lab, so this was 
this was in like that's that's CB we got CB walls in there and that was an initially how it was uh, and this is kind of the model for what we want to have here out in the patio in the front so this is Hab Lab <laughs> make that Hab Lab make a nice patio out front oh, yeah. with your swimming pool and aquaponics oh, how about that that's Hab Lab? What happened? To it will be Hab Lab. Oh, okay. Well, so we're going to get the tours at some point. Yeah, you know, you can... Oh, someone mentioned here that buildings are 20% upon start, and they evolve over life. So 80% of a building is typically the afterlife over what you built in the so-called build, whether it's remodeling or adding things onto it. And we are designing... Um, so that's how it looked initially. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of the floor plan there. So that's, that's this building. And then we went into micro houses. So these things like this, that was the first one built. It's also CEB. And this kind of structure is convenient. You got a loft for sleeping there. That turned into Jeff's house because we added the second side to it. Uh, that's the, uh, the kitchen, right? Jeff's right now it's Jeff's kitchen, but this is the that's now micro house one and this is micro house two another very small CB structure we Got the time-lapse of it being built, but see see the first one Then we put the second one in there and then connected them in between and after that Added the back so we were actually pressing brick real-time as we built it It does work and then the walls come up right from the dirt beneath our feet to get this process efficient like I mean this is a kind of hard work conveyors work really well on that and see so tractor loading stuff in the meantime um, the block here is actually the slurry between the block and the other step you want to add to this is the double basket the basket technique which means uh, as you lay the block you lay wire some kind of a connected tie two kinds of wire that af then afterwards you put on some kind of a either chicken wire or more like lath, like metal lath, or like, uh, yeah, like whatever kind of a covering that gets you two sides that you can let it stuck on. And that's better actually than rebar through the walls in terms of earthquake protection. So you definitely... Uh, yeah, it's like that. So that was just, that's just like deer fence, deer fence. You can use like that plastic screen like they use in construction construction sites with uh with the big holes like the orange stuff that's pretty that's has, that's probably properly or something like that's pretty strong with all that mass of it they're fresh so that means you're gonna you have to design for a little bit of settling so for example if you if you do do this so then there's you know a few these, these parts here are wood built on the, on the sides there. Um, if you do the top plate, if you do the basket technique, you can put the top plate on. Could be wood, could be concrete, bond beam on top. Don't put rebar stakes through it. Just lay it on top. It'll settle about three quarters of an inch after all the water dries out. These are like fresh, pretty much wet, uncured brick. It works if you design for that as long as like your windows um, you have to allow for, for things to basically settle just a little bit. And that, and that could be an art in itself like how you do that. You don't hear the brick before you look up. You do. That's the industry standard is to do that. If if you were we were here and we were actually wanting to well first we were experimenting with is it actually feasible and doable in terms of time? It is. It's a really cool thing. Like say, you know, like disaster relief or whatever under certain conditions. But the industry standard. I mean, yeah, you dry them. The standard is to actually put some concrete in them so you get stabilized blocks, and therefore they're waterproof. Here they're not. So what we're doing is we're putting siding on, because otherwise, in the first rain, that will all melt. Um, that's that's kind of the system. Right? And, loader mounted pulverizer on that and there you go so that's micro house we call that micro house too uh, one question yeah so one uh, good thing about the CEB is that it can uh, um, sort of equalize the air pressure and the temperature right uh, there are many advantages to CEBs does that, does that still work with the insulation around 
uh, you'd have to be careful about exactly what you do there. If it's impermeable, then you no longer have that feature. So you might want to go into things like lime, lime plasters. So basket technique, if you want to watch a nice video of, of the advantages of CEB, this is a very good one by a builder who's from the United States. Um, so here's the explanation of the basket technique for earthquake reinforcement. Take a look at that. So that's this video, video here. But this, this presentation here, well, I mean, this guy reinforcement. shows that yeah, shows like what happens. You get, this is have one you guys of, seen uh, this? Yeah, it's real important. Uh, so they have Mexico. this demo house. This is actually a it's test. I think in, they tested this in Peru. The yeah, this particular shake table that you're seeing here so is it's a shake table. They shake the whole house. <laughs> they are very concerned with seismic reinforcement of earth going to the Peru shake. Yeah. I think this was a Richter 7 cast state. I don't, I'm not positive. Well, this, this is the kind of thing that gives Adobe a bad name right there. <laughs> so that's the, was that the first one? And then they. No, that's a 7. Well, I don't know when. I guess. So that's Richter 7 earthquake simulation. And that's the same with stabilized. So that's this building. You can kind of see the mesh wrapped around there. And Some mesh. What happens. And I think they just used that plastic poly mesh thing. So what happens is this, in this case. See, so it kind of wobbles back and forth. It doesn't want to give. This is the one you want to be in. So that stood up. They did a similar test in Berkeley. I know the engineer that was at, at that test, and they did a building that they, uh, they used the same building all the way or through. They started on in terms of width, a little bit like rebar compared to this. And yeah. patch it. And it was uh, I think this is cheaper. So they did that. I mean, then they put the plastic mesh is. They shook a little bit it's actually quite doable. It's you gotta have stucco, then, but you gotta have stucco in either case. If you gotta protect it somehow from the outside, so it's actually very doable. I mean, we did that. Let's continue. Let's continue in the genealogy. We did that technique later on. So I'll show you show you where we did that. Uh, where did the Here's genealogy. So, faculty house, that's Curtis's home, that's how it was initial. They're doing that, that's that's what it was. That's also CEBs. Um, we did that in a workshop, but we built like like two thirds of it in CEBs, then we built up with, with wood since uh, we couldn't finish it otherwise. Then Micro House 3 was an addition onto the Micro House 2. And wood is just oh no, they call it. Sorry, wood is way faster. It's way easier. So the difference between uh, we call this micro house four, actually, yeah. So that's Jeff's place, and it was freshly built. The back back walls are that's also CB on the back. And here we experiment with these three foot wide, sixteen foot long roof modules. So they're in the ceiling. Uh, they're kind of heavy. You had to do them in two layers, two layers of two by six. So they end up being a two by twelve equivalent. So you can do a span mm -hmm. like that. It works. Is there any code issue with uh, there being a split in the wood um, on a on a length lengthwise? Don't know, because that wasn't uh, we weren't looking at codes at that time. Okay. okay. <laughs> Is there a second floor on that one? No, okay. just just the first. <laughs> it's, it's so then the. Yeah, so CD Home, Eco Home has built first. Now we, Katrina added this other addition here and we're kind of keeping on evolving this thing uh, to the point where it's like, you know, that's that's in the back there. Uh, we had aqua Those are actual photos, those aren't renders. No, those are real photos. That's, uh, that's the pool in the back. So that was the aquaponic setup and Katrina ripped it out because she's got a bad back so she needs to swim. So <laughs> convert it into a pool. Uh, uh, now this is, <laughs> that is that's <laughs> real. A uh, tour is coming up this week, so we'll do that. Awesome. Um, but this is the aquaponics is built initially on a on a, um, the Jeff's house, but that's that's all run down right now. We we would have to recondition that. And just to go to CB Microhouse build in Belize, so that was <clears throat> the Belize build. Um, 
well let's let's take a look at so that's the cat in it and three cat once again a very simple shed structure but what you want to look at is some pictures uh, so we did the basket technique we did the actual stucco plus it was just chicken wire on both sides so but that was pretty cool because I mean once we had a flow of people working like those walls went up super fast but were those, were those, were those bricks pre-made uh, off-site they're pre-made on-site or oh, pre-made on-site okay yeah okay. Um, but we started this with so that's the like a very basic foundation there the way to do this fast is if you have some forms to lay the bricks against like if you have strings strings don't work because too many people move them around mm -hmm. so what we did was we after the foundation here that was prepared beforehand as far as the foundation but uh, we laid up these forms uh, they were just wood forms up like that I mean so that we can have a board so we can lay the bricks to them oh, that's yeah, like yeah. building another house almost because they had to be like perfectly straight and all that so um, it's kind of hard so how do you solve the straight walls question well uh, I'm thinking if we do something like so that with the rebar like the rebar truss structure like if you already have flat posts to work against then you can lay really really fast that'll be one way to oh, do okay, it okay so aug it out post it down as yeah. long as it's good yeah so so the next thing is what we want to do is do this uh, modular this thing here like this is actually what we're looking at as a really good way to do this but this is uh, that's the design imagine a structure like that with 20 on 20 centers and that's the rebar truss made of the rebar trusses you see laying down on the ground there mm -hmm. well four of them together to form a truss like that with uh, 1100 pounds it deflects like a quarter inch we just tested it so this is really cool so imagine you have this whole thing and you crank out your bricks and just lay them across straight boards behind you know just mount some boards there that will be a quick build very effective way to do it uh, we look forward to that and I mentioned about making the bricks a little smaller because right now there's four by six by twelve and about twenty pounds each after all day they, they get heavy on you so but that's that's a kind of a concept for what you want to do for a fast like really fast build um, but yeah, I mean, look at the extent of this, <laughs> this pre-framed, like we just did this to get a straight set of posts so that we can lay against them very rapidly. And we did, like we were laying and it's like three, three seconds per block, like the person hands it over, there's slurry available, lay it on the ground, lay it on the wall, next one, like literally, like so it was almost like, like this. It's not like a brick laying where you have to get the fine level at with the mortar. Here you can even use water as the mortar because the water will actually melt the block and make them bond to each other. So that's, um, yeah. Um, Is that what you actually used that the mortar was water? Just like uh, it, was, it? it was actually a watered down mixture of the soil uh, okay. with a little bit of cement in here since the bricks were stabilized. Yeah, we use stabilization, but I mean, as far as the quality control and stabilization, it's like they did it with a rototiller and just by hand. You can't really get that uniformity. So the next deal there is the soil mixer, a dedicated machine that does the mixing and dosing of the appropriate amount of cement. Otherwise, you don't have any quality control. And you know, one brick might be good, another one's got a soft spot, stuff like that. So, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that was pretty good. We were mixing uh, the actual. Yeah, that was actually the slurry we were mixing for with a tractor auger and just uh, those. So that was basically a lot of the soil, a little bit of cement and a bunch of water. So that's a slurry so that we used. So cement is what makes it, prevents it from melting in the rain once it's built. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then the stucco that you do at the end also protects it? Yeah, the stucco, if, cause so we did like at the very end, the stucco, maybe go down and we got tons of pictures here. So yeah, here you see the, this is just chicken wire, both sides. And the stucco is not too bad. I mean, you, you do your stucco, it's like that. You 
put a nail in and then twist it around and screw it in to get that mesh into the wall. You can screw right into the bricks still. So that's what we did, that, that kind of a technique. Um, so in, in this case, the chicken wire is there for the earthquake structure stability or for like a plaster on the outside? Chicken wire was, this is just to test an earthquake design. Okay. Not sure if they have earthquakes down there, but now this is like Belize's and right next to the water. Man, as soon as we put up that chicken wire, it starts rusting. Oh. It's like they, the, the guy said, hey, you can't do that here. Um, we don't have enough communication to, to know that. Um, but um, uh, we plastic poured. Mesh would be better for a place like that. Yeah, like plastic wouldn't. Yeah, this is going to rust. Like in the, the maritime environments mm -hmm. next to the sea, like stuff just will rust on you. So it'll have to be stainless or something else. Uh, we poured like a top bond beam there. Um, and that does, the, the goal is earthquake stabilization and something for the slurry, or the stucco to stick to. That yeah, is yeah, yeah. So once you lay the stucco, it's really nice and easy. You can just stucco all over that. And here, there's like a top concrete bond beam. So that, I mean, that house is super solid and all that. But yeah, let's move on to, um, let's see. <laughs> You said a top concrete bond beam? Yeah, yeah, we just poured a top concrete bond beam. Oh, you, put, you, you, you set up a thing and then poured it in place? And yeah, I mean, oh, buckets just, just by hand. It wasn't too big, it's, it's like 12 inches wide and a few inches, but yeah, a few good buckets of... Is there a strap of rebar in that bond beam? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, we've got, you see the forms laid up there. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, we got strands of concrete, strands of, so that's the, if you notice the basket technique, you got the mesh all the way around it and all the way at the bottom, so it's a complete wrap, I mean, it'll just kind of float with the punches, and then uh, the rebar, two strands of rebar, so yeah, a bunch of forming there, but yeah, very solid at the end, and look how thick that was, we just mixed that. When you make it so thick, it makes it super strong as opposed, like the least water you have, the more more strong, most strong it is. If you got it runny, it just doesn't have as, as much strength. It was kind of interesting to see that because like guys were arguing, this one guy was a concrete engineer and people were saying, well, what's that? It's like, you gotta put some more water in it, but you could actually see when this set, so the other side, like the other guys there, they did it much more runny. But then after this set, you can knock on it, you can, completely hear how much more solid that was compared to the other side. But that, Definitely. that wouldn't have cure time. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the chemical reaction of that yeah. curing over time is really the, 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 arc, arc, right? the, the concrete strength. So well, you get quite a bit after 24 hours, like 50% after 24 hours or so. But, I mean, you only, you, as long as you get it in the form and kind of level it, it's good enough there. I was, I was kind of surprised to see that, but no, that, that concrete engineer guy actually knew what he was talking about. Uh, was the form <laughs> screwed into the <laughs> structure? <laughs> the or form? Was it, or was it just like set on top? Like oh yeah, so yeah, that was uh, screwed in. If, we, if you look at some of the details here, yeah, I mean we try to like screw it into the side of the house as much as we can. Somewhere like lay it in between like, yeah, we'll have to span the walls because it has to be as thick as the walls so yeah. it was kind of hard that was a lot of work to put it up there but yeah boards that are on the side of the house and try to reinforce them to make them stick there and then of course you got gaps so we would stick like newspaper in there whatever to close them up and, and stuff like that the forms take off okay. take off so you let's see what is the see is there any pictures at the very very end well look at that the water oh, cool. And they have these shutters at the end of the day. That's their version of shutters. Um, oh, like they open and close? They're yeah. Not just like boards? Yep, they open and close. Oh, nice. oh, that's oh, wow. cool. That looks pretty good. So that's. Man, that's a nice finish there. It's beautiful, yeah. It's uh, you know what they did for the plywood there? What's the industry standard in Belize for protecting wood? Uh, tar? Used motor oil. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> I mean, it will protect it. 
if that's what you got is what you got and you can see the dark dark and lovely color uh, we got some aerials and stuff um, during yeah some guy br brought a drone to get us a little view over the top oh it looks beautiful there too yeah and it was yeah like the the sea is like right there and stuff but yeah everyone builds out of block and metal not a lot of wood why i mean termites nothing there survives the termites so yeah everything is concrete and steel hmm how much uh, was the overall cost? Of this cost was like 5,000 bucks or so. Still not that cheap. I mean, you end up paying for all the materials like the concrete and stuff. Rebar. It's about the same. Because the materials there are just about the same. The wood, we use this locally cut wood, comparable prices to what's here. Uh, it was pretty rot resistant, very heavy wood. Like we asked for two by fours and we got two by fours. <laughs> Not one and, and a half. And man, they were like <laughs> probably like three times as strong as like a standard two by four here. Like the wood was rock solid and it was actually a two by four. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, we really overdid the wood. Like we we just used like half the trusses we had because they were so solid. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so that's, that was a pretty cool adventure. Um, and Where's then the it's it's happening right now. <laughs> this is it. We're in, We're in it. CB Microhouse build manual. Oh yeah, so we started on this build manual for the microhouses. Like, um, what is this about? Is this more like for the old versions or this CD home? Because uh, we have one that's actually a simple thing called house design guide. So here we're trying to document actually like the more detail, everything about everything about it. Okay, so how do you do electrical? How do you do a roof? How do you do a stairway? How do you do the wall modules and floor? So um, that's work in progress, but we're trying to simply document like all the systems we have. Like, okay, starting with what's solving housing. Um, Uh, so we talked about that, but look at this. Like, oh, this would be the expanded version where it's that's the initial, and that's the first edition on a. This is actually a whole square edition. So that's rosebud. That will be like, that's the edition we're actually planning on that. So we're gonna take rosebud, um, and do a staggered edition on the back for a thousand square feet, just to see how the expandability works. It's designed for expansion, as you may have seen. Um, yeah, I mean. We're documenting all this. Katrina and I were kind of concluding that, uh, like what we're building right now, it's different because it seems to be like st quite st stabilizing. This floor, like we did, that's exact same thing. We didn't have to change anything on it. Works really well. Um, yeah, that was wait, that was the initial idea. Easier. That's the second idea, as we implied yesterday. This is much easier. Um, <laughs> polished concrete could be beautiful. Um, look at that one, that's, um, that was the initial concept of the, the Aspen, uh, not, not much trimmed up or finished yet, but yeah, so it's like, oh, how do you build a house? Oh, you just need a foundation, walls, windows, doors, roof and kitchen and other things. So you kind of try to identify a pattern language of building blocks that can get you to just about anything. So how do you design a door? You can actually get some insights out of these things. How do you do the roof? This is what we're doing for the roof. You know, uh, the different layers of it. Um, how do you design a gutter? Core utility module, that's what we have. This We're gonna get to this in a second home, but we have a very simple, like in one corner, there's the bathroom and kitchen on the other side so we're sharing the plumbing in these two utility walls which make for a super compact design of all your utilities which cost the rough and plumbing was under 500 bucks typically it's like 5,000 bucks now it's a small house but I mean you can design it super simple all it is is basically some drainage and water access going through the pad 
like right away right there next to the wall so you make it super simple just just two penetration three penetrations well actually you can say two penetrations so there's one hole here which has these two pipes and then the other one for the for the toilet just two penetrations in the entire house water also comes in through there typically you might have a foundation where you got all these pipes and stubs coming up you gotta when you do the concrete you gotta work around them much simpler so just do it do the simplicity by design um, components like what are all the components just try to break it down to the the critical aspects that you need um, all the different shark yeah shark bite fittings uh, the water supply is going to be you know, how do you do the the bath the the bath that's the minimum viable product bathroom and we're following that pretty much exactly that's what we're doing it's like you got the small space you got a tub fitting within five feet and you got a toilet and a sink or or you can reverse those uh, we, we have actually this but just mirror image of that um, bathroom how you design a bathroom how do you design a kitchen um, here's like you know, critical components critical appliances those are the choices we actually made for various reasons earthquakes what do you have to do for that winds we're designing for 100 mile per hour winds and like 25 or 30 PSF loads on the roof so for you said 25 yeah I think the roof is 30 the first floor is like 20 I'm, I'm not sure but it's it's like within code so it would get you up to like uh, near Minnesota <laughs> there you might have to go 45 more roof yeah <laughs> yeah for tornadoes um, is, there any, is that uh, is that wind mode cover for tornadoes and do you you, you can't protect it industry standard is like 90 for okay. what houses have to be built to and then so basements is that a consideration or is that just uh, too much of a cost driver cost too driver that's like building another house underground right. a lot of excavation yeah and definitely water. cost it's so much harder yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. how you design an electrical system all the components broken down what we're doing is a utility channel we'll get into this but basically in the bottom of a wall we run all the wires through a utility channel at the bottom so we pre-build the electrical outlets into the walls we didn't do that here uh, but we did it in the other house the V2 then run wires from the brick box readily through this utility channel so you're not going through any studs or anything like that it's just very simple so paying attention to this modular structure um, how do you do a foundation this discusses how we do it but that's the you know, just to review this thing like how do we get a square once again you got to remember this technique it's not easy because it's like there's too many moving things like you're dealing with reality but the procedure that we use and works and gets you a perfect square in like 10 minutes fix so you say doing a, the foundation forms uh, fix the forms on this side measure 32 feet here so that's say that's your short side so you fix the short side measure 32 feet and then put a mark there a little dot and then the idea is that the hypotenuse should be a particular distance like three four five triangle which it's not here and this is like 16 and 32 but it's the hypotenuse it should be a certain distance which will define that that angle there is exactly 90 degrees so in practice okay put a little point there well but you don't know where you are there so you might want to put a couple of points we'll also put another next to it next to it where you're 32 well eventually that really draws out a like a very very wide arc so draw a line there and then draw that corresponding arc for, from the length that you determine by taking 16 squared plus 32 squared and take the square root of that it will get you a very explicit number mm -hmm. and that's the length of this line here so measure that with a tape put a, a point there or a few points which that's effectively make an arc where they intersect is exactly exactly your corner point that is square no question about it so do that now what are you going to do here well um, same 
if you ha yeah if you have this this point here so from there you're going to measure the 32 uh, but you don't have to touch this like don't worry about like because what would happen sometimes it's like you, you get this pretty close oh cool great I'm gonna go to the next point see if I can do any better and then you go back to it and back to that and <laughs> takes forever so just fix it you know that's good so you can repeat the same process there and you got a square house and then you can at the end you can verify 16 and 32 but you should be able to do within a fraction of an inch like a quarter and or an eighth like pretty pretty reliably actually and this is only 16 by 32 so it's not huge huge distances but you should be able to do this if you kind of think about it and you got to play it out in your mind like you got to really think about it and say okay what what steps do i take so you're clear about it and if you do it you do that once you don't have to like repeat oh now i gotta go back to this point or you know like kind of stuff what you do first time and it takes you a little bit of time to learn it but once you got it it's like bam you just know how to do it but that i would call this is somewhat skilled because you got to work with measurements you got to work with putting in stakes that don't move strings that don't get tied up or are tight enough or tape measure that you want to make sure that your tape end does not come off the catch point or whatever like make sure you're reading the tape right there's a few moving elements here that if you get any of those wrong you'll be doing this like for a long time and get frustrated with it so but there's a good procedure that's well defined you can google that that's the kind of foundation we were using yeah but I mean the essence is this this is that's what people do in the real world that's that's quite common we do this human scale the complete point of this is human scale they do things like this for example structural insulated panels will be somewhat like that or we're doing the so-called DIY structural insulated panel just by adding the little rail system to our design and that works works well so we only have so many different modules that's like uh, initial designs from 2016 oh yeah so that's expandability that that was the initial Aspen model that we were thinking about okay how do you expand it well you can expand it to whatever you want and it could look like whatever you want to make it look we're not doing the uh, the standard gable roofs flat roof is actually much easier it's faster to build it's got issues on snow loads so in northern climates it's not a great idea but people still do it. you don't have to just reinforce so much uh, what about for a uh, solar panel um, designing for passive and the necessary slope to get the best from the Sun uh, yeah what, what roof slope is that that's degrees. like 30 or so <coughs> so we don't have that here but because uh, so for example if you have this little that's decorative on the roof there that's that's decorative but on, you can actually make the panels angled if you rack them on your roof at a at, a, at an angle oh, you can still good. do it um, we were gonna do it actually flat in terms of so EPDM has it like a 20 year lifetime or so but if you say you put panels on top of it you can protect that EPDM and then you have like infinite lifetime EPDM because it's not degraded by the elements so the PV could actually be a means to protect the roof if you're using EPDM rubber that's EPDM that cost 500 bucks for that roll which was 50 by 20 all right 50 by 20 thousand square feet for 500 bucks that's like most cost-effective you can do that's a pretty good long decent long life but 20 torture or anything no you just roll it and no the way we do it is because we have 500 square feet we're wrapping it around the edges and and making all the connections around the edges no punctures at all in the top including the PV like after when we install the PV we're gonna straddle a beam probably metal or wood from one side to the other the panels sit on that we're not screwing into that that's how you'll get a roof that has no problem for your life so question on the EPDM yeah so you have a tree fall on your roof and make a puncture how do you repair that do you have to get a few do you have to fuse a there's actually a patch kit with solvent glue that they sell for that kind of okay. stuff okay. And that's yeah. pretty, pretty, must be pretty reliable. it's pretty reliable yeah but it's a weak point 
it would be the first thing that would go probably. Yeah. Uh, and we poked a hole in ours when we were installing ours with our team. Uh, so yeah, just the patch kit will do it. Um, so how do you mount solar without piercing the PPM? So you would take the roof and you would have, so you add, attach a piece of wood on the edge, which also binds the, your EPDM and then run a long beam that's a little bit more than 16 feet so you're screwing into mm -hmm. the thing that's actually right off the edge. So you can use metal angle or you can use like two by sixes or something like that. Um, and for specifics of like structural engineering, you can um, run that through an engineer. But another way people do PV is ballast systems. They just put cinder blocks up there to weigh down the the PV mounts. That's another way to do it. Uh, so here, the most effective way to do it would be to put all the weight on the on the edge. Plenty of, I mean, the edge is the strongest. It's, that's where the walls are. So the middle would be the weakest. Uh, but yeah, you can ballast it. Just heavy weight on that. So that's good. Uh, what else? What else we gotta do? Tool chains, man. Right now, we've got this. That's actually. That's Sweet Home 3D. You got Blender. You got Blender BIM, Building Information Modeling, uh, OpenStreetMap imports into Blender. You can get landscapes into Blender. So between FreeCAD, Sweet Home, and Blender, and Inkscape for like diagrams and blueprints, there's decent tool chains can for open architecture. Can you pass information from FreeCAD to Sweet Home and back and forth? There's a technique that's documented on a wiki. Uh, blend. Uh, yeah, FreeCAD slash Sweet Home interoperability. You have to do a few things. For example, the, when you export from from uh, the Sweet Home, it shows up ten times smaller, so that you got to scale in Blender. Okay. And then you have the OBJ files. They're meshes. You can also convert those into solids. There's another process for that. So it's kind of awkward, but a good um, exporter, like an automated exporter. Right now, you got to do a few things, like you got to scale it, got to batch. Ex there's a process for batching. You can take a whole bunch of parts because the initial, fo yeah. So you can. We've done this. So let's actually take a look at it because um, uh, let's go to. FreeCAD Blender, no, no, FreeCAD Sweet Home. You can, you got to do a few steps though, because um, the big point is within Sweet Home, you could either do like this big, massive, dumb object. Yeah, that's you can just export one thing. But how about get the individual parts, two by four lumber, two by twelve with the correct names imported into FreeCAD. Yes, you can do that. There's a process, but it involves going into into Blender. So a good software task is to automate that process, because right now it's manual. You've got to do like three steps um, in a batch process. You can do batch processing that everything actually comes out. But yeah, it takes a few minutes right now. So an automation of that would be really useful. Um, so we got tool chains. Uh, that's like Blender BIM, like cross sections of a building. So you can, how do you generate architecture documents? The best we can do right now is take stuff into Inkscape or even simple stuff in Google Docs. You can, like for example, right now when we're passing on our info to the engineer, the structural engineer, which we've done, we gave him Google Doc. Here's like all that stuff that Katrina generates, those, those renderings and stuff like that. We just give it to him. But the way it works well, according to our visit with a structural engineer, if we have a FreeCAD model, they don't know what FreeCAD is, but they know step. So you export it as step file, and, and they can completely take it from there. Step. Step. And then what's that mean? You reduce your cost because they don't have to generate those drawings for you. You give them the full model, so your structural engineer cost mm -hmm. will be much lower. So that's, that's a good thing if you have the full digital model that's useful. Um, Can we access this um, Google slide that you have? Of course. Go to, wiki? yeah, it's called the uh, House Design Guide on the wiki. So that's all in there. Cool concept is having libraries of parts that are iconized, 
Um, within FreeCAD, there's a good thing we can do, which is actually design whole workbenches within FreeCAD. There's a way to do that. Uh, we actually have a thing called FreeCAD Workbenches Platform, uh, where you can put drag and drop. You can put the part into FreeCAD. You drag and drop it into a working doc. Uh, so we can program FreeCAD. If you, this is in Python now, to to have all the parts that such that the design is click of a button. You don't have to think about okay, what's this part look like? You can actually drag and drop the correct parts into a working doc to make a full design. That's very useful. We don't have that for the the current material, but that's readily doable. That's a software task that we can you know, get some collaboration on. Then there's other machines. Oh, truss designs. So actually, the trusses we're doing, this is how we do them. Read this. Uh, this is actually from the, it's called the uh, Roof Trust Guide. Yeah, there's a book out there called Roof Trust Guide. It's an appropriate <laughs> technology design book. So it's free online, so you can actually take a look at it. You can trust us. <laughs> yeah. That's it. We're cut off. <laughs> uh, what else we got? We ended the trusses. That's, that's our latest. But yeah, yeah, so there's quite a bit of material in there. Um, just to finish up the, well, that, that, that finishes it. That's the CD go home two and three right now. So we should get to the walls. Uh, the walls are fully, fully documented in terms of what we want to build today in a workshop. So let's get to that. We've got 1121. Yeah, we've got, so and just so everybody knows, they're on post-it notes. Everything that's been completed, that, uh, those post-it notes should have a C on them. Um, and then, oh, it's across, yeah. across. Um, yeah, once the module is finished, we have the post-it notes. There's 24 of them. Take one, put it on your table so we know that that's being worked on. When you're done, put a cross on it, put it back on the board. So that's a great way to organize. We've got eight of them already. Also, take the pen and write in big letters uh, the name of the panel. So on the panel, on the top, if possible, possible, you know. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So label the panel itself. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So this is the doc here at page 22. Uh, is the second floor. So second story. Uh, so once again, these are links to each individual file but also they're already uh, outlined like this. Uh, problem is text is too small. Uh, but it does get you, if you can read that, full cut list. So that's the front and back left corner. Um, I don't know if we necessarily want to go through. I mean, it's fully detailed, so all the details. What are the conceptual things we have to worry about? Okay, say we do the windows. Well, you're cutting the aperture that's exactly the same as the window framing. It's not like inset or outset. But you've got to watch out for you where your offset is. The plywood is offset, though. Plywood is always offset to the left if you're looking from the outside. For the, the plywood, easiest to cut strips. Don't worry about cutting out a hole inside one piece. Do strips. It's easier. It doesn't really matter because uh, we still have exterior siding on top of this. So there's one more layer. Um, what are some other notes? Oh yeah, so for the door, the only trick there is we've got a spacer. Um, let's see. Yeah, these are Offset easier, to, these are easier to go through when we're like at down there yeah building but in, so the only things that we can remember in general is all the OSB is actually four by four by it's actually 112 so there's a different number here it's 112 right the number we got yesterday instead of being 10 feet which is 120 we're going with 112 right is that correct yes yeah. okay and the overhang on the bottom we we had one inch before now it's two inches because it now it, it's just a little different than before. Plywood always set offset to the left, so the male part sticks to the right. Actually, all the plywood is four wide except for the eight corner pieces. All that plywood happens to be 46.5. 
So on plywood, there's two types. One is the full width for everything outside of the eight corner pieces. When you're doing a corner, you're going to have to trim a, a three quarter. Is that correct? Three quarter. Uh, did I say 47.25? Was it Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's three quarters. And how do you think about it? Like, you always start at the left, we're doing like we're reading from left to right. So in a corner, you're going to be aligned with the corner. Because we are male, uh, there's male framing, a uh, plywood is offset this, this way, while well, you don't have a full four foot panel. So that kind of explains why you're actually three quarters under. Now that might be complicated, but the point is the, four, the eight corners are three quarters trimmed on the plywood side. And beyond that, the adjustment modules are all one and a half inch under. But, okay, so the big point, uh, because we, we actually reduced the number of dissimilar modules, so Katarina said, okay, let's put that adjustment into the corner, put everything in there. So we have more modules that are regular. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, all the adjustment goes into the corner module, so some cor corner modules will be, uh, four, four of them That's will be yeah. adjust. That, uh, the adjust ones as well. They're not only a corner, they're also an adjustment. That's all in the details. So if you follow the details, they'll be there. So maybe uh, start with easier stuff like the ones that are not corners, which is also the hidden door, which has got the header. The, yeah, the like only the things door. that are left are non, non-standard. So windows, yeah. doors, and corners. That's all that stuff. You got eight corners, four windows, that's 12. Two doors, that's 14. And we did eight, which totals 24. So that's right. Uh, yeah, so everything left is non-standard. So we've got to follow. How do you do it? Uh, put it on computers. Yeah, we'll put it. We'll, we'll should make those we'll labels a little bigger. bigger. We should have two laptops with the docs open. Okay. Yeah, I'll have a, a tablet with it open as well. Um, and, and whatever we're doing them, let's strategically do all of the dissimilar ones that are grouped together. So doors together, windows together, and the corners together, just so everybody is operating under the same. Yeah, and we have different. Do we have non standardization. Do we have different colors on the uh, on the sticky notes? We do. Okay. Other than Some. The there's only three right? colors. Uh, according to this, we still have the feature of the opposites being the same. Mm -hmm. So this one is the same as that one. This corner is the same as that. This one is the same as that. Exactly. So it's actually, I think, better than before. Before we had even more. It was. I was a little, yeah, especially at the top, the two, because yeah, I was saying that they yeah. should be. Oh man, I'm seeing. Okay, that that crack there, I don't like because that's in the wrong place. We said the adjustment is in the in the corner. So, um. So, okay, I gotta tell Katrina that's. See, see the adjustment. So the adjustment is shown there. Um, it's correct. It's in there. It's adjustment is this module. Yeah, I thought the adjustment was on this the one would be one. this module. But it would be, yeah, that yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, it would be there. Mm -hmm. And that one is good to me. Yep. yep, yep. That should be good in a... In these. I'll, I'll take, kind of take a look at it. I'll see if I see any mistakes. Um, but it's relatively relatively straightforward. Just typically you're still building the... At least at the, at the point of the outer frame. Yeah, you're still, <laughs> still good. For the, wind, the, the pre framed door, that's a door. Window, 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 headers. You got headers there. So we need a bunch of those 2x12s, double headers. Oh yeah, under the headers here, we don't have enough space to put another another board. We're taking the window all the way up to it because the window is pretty big. So we don't have any space left there. The, the design for the wi window top is determined by the, where the door top is so that aesthetically it's trimmed, like the trim is at the same level between the doors and windows. Yeah, other than that, it's a detail. Are the adjustment panels always made shorter, or? They are. Mm -hmm. They're always 1.5 shorter, so so if that is an adjustment module, yeah. the long lengths are all 48. 
except for adjustment, which is going to be 46.5. Mm. So that's the one, the adjustment is always 1.5. The plywood tabs are always three quarter. So that's going to be 46.5, those two. Uh, these are not adjustment. They're going to be full 48s. Everything else here is going to be full 48. Uh, if that's adjustment and that's adjustment, uh, those are not adjustments, but those are 42.5. Those, I believe, are going to be 42.5 minus that 1.5. So 41. So there's, I, I'm seeing a 41 there. So it's a little different than when we cut. We thought everything was going to be 42.5. We got to take that 42.5, cut off 1.5 because they're going to be adjustments. So there's a good couple yeah. of like 41. Perfect. Uh, uh, four of them because top and bottom plate, top and bottom plate. So four. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and so just one more thing about like safety and imagination um always don't do anything that you think is gonna even if you have the inclination that you're gonna get hurt doing it. Yeah. and then yeah on the imagination piece like um can't really do a lot of imagination with the building and how it's built but you can do imagination on the ways that we utilize the most minimum amount of force to get something done right ramps pulleys fulcrums right but we don't really want to expend a lot of energy and we want to keep those like small people in mind. So like the ramp and uh, just a simple rope with two people at the top it may work, it may not work, but just keep your imagination open and, and, and sometimes just step back and take a few minutes to say, okay, okay, not everybody's going to have a tracker, not everybody's going to have like the brute strength of all of us, you know, very lucky people, yeah. but um, we can figure out ways to really, really do it that's, that's much, much easier. We just have to have that, a little bit of true. patience and, and, yeah. and talk about it with one another. Because that's the that's the power. There's a lot of power, a lot of brain power, a lot of fucking engineering and highly skilled people in here that can, you know, we can come up with systems that will make. I'm hoping that the, the yeah. platforms and maybe this ramp thing will make everything easier, yeah. so it can be done every time, right? We're talking about we find the best system, and that system can be replicated everywhere, and then yeah. no more picking them up. With we can spend more time. Just a little bit. I, I don't want to. I don't. I, we're we're churning. We're but churning. That's that's good. That's what I'm trying to say. Like maybe if we spend a little more time doing the tools, then we can replicate. Like we can put it as part of the the system. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean everyone can contribute that, so you can think about it in your ample spare time and make <laughs> it happen. <laughs> I have one little note, uh, so we were building the wall modules yesterday, the 8 first, and uh, some of the bottom and top smaller pieces happened to be, like I think it was a couple of them, it was an like eighth of an inch too long, so just make a, a measurement before you put those on, otherwise they would be too wide in the base or too wide in the top. So just quality control uh, those pieces when we make the frame. Yeah, any, any that we thought were over, we did replace yeah, yeah, we'll take that out, yeah, yeah. So, but And if you find that, you can just pass the miter saw on it and, and get that eighth of an inch up. Right, and ultimately we have that 1.5 adjustment at the end of the day that's available. So, uh -huh. and we might want to yeah. reduce that if we find that oh, this time we never really needed that. Like we were close to 1.5 just about everywhere, so we might want to reduce that gap for the next time. Can we put the tabs? Tabs, yes. So we've got the same rail alignment mm -hmm. system. So the the base plate not treated. So now it will actually go on. Treated lumber was a little wider, so it was a little troublesome. But we're going to use the same bottom plate, which is an extra part we're adding for the purpose of alignment, and then the top plate. So he has tabs. So there's going to be another sill plate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are we putting the tabs into the sill? Yes, there is. Yeah. And, and tabs into the sill, and then just leaving it up. Uh, tabs into the bottom of the wall modules. The bottom module. That's the first yeah. tab. Yeah, like the yeah, yeah. The same as the first floor. Uh -huh. yeah. So that's different than last time. Last time we did not use any alignment. Okay, sill so plate on the second floor. Yeah. The next step. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Should, should, should just, just take just some two by two by six by six things up there. Out, maybe or maybe <laughs> we not. never should cut them right anyway. Should the tabs be put on when, yeah. when when they're up there? I think we won't have the same issues the first time because this one is not treated. It's not going to be a uh, quarter of an inch too, too wide. Mm -hmm. It's going to be five and a half. Yeah. Ah, so the only thing on a on a sill plate use a strength because those things could be. We don't know how how great the wall is. Let's adjust for any inaccuracy. 
you just run a long string line from one end to the next and put the soap plate next to that. Yeah. That'll get us a nice rail. These, yeah. these top, top wall modules, technical wall modules, the bottom OSB overhang is two inches now. Two inches now. Yeah, so you gotta be a yes. little more careful. You can't uh -huh. like put it down on that edge. Right, right. The other, other thing oh, yeah. is the space yeah. on the yeah. south of the house. Like we don't have much space to kind of put We have four feet. Or, or like kind of put the scaffold. Maybe well, scaffolding maybe should be enough, right? Should be enough. Yeah. Okay, but I think we should uh, take it into account. Yeah. yeah. Wait, yeah, can you say it again? Like the, the south part of the house. Yeah. Uh, where the double door is. Right. There's like a oh, small that. gap, you know, like uh, we don't have much space like, for something to bring the truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the ramp will work. Uh, we'll just bring it on the opposite side and spin it around to, to go over there, and then hopefully there will be a scaffolding on the best side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll yeah. see. I think we've got it in the uh, And the scaffolding is four feet, and we made four feet wide for yeah. on the, the side of the house, so we'll get okay. yeah. 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 And this time you have a uh, two inch offset on the OSB on the bottom. But the space on the outside should still be one inch, right? Three quarters. Three quarters. Three quarters. Three quarters. Okay. Then it makes sense to slide them up and then erect them. If this is the inside of the house, this is the house, you do like this and go over. So the this the neck will have some Right. Right. I guess. Yeah. I don't want to break that. I'm really worried about breaking that. I guess that's the only way to do it, anyways. Yeah, like we're gonna go from the inside. Well, no, we gotta go from the outside always. Right. Um, which yeah, is the proper way for standing them up? Then we're anyway. resting the OSB on the on the lower OSB, like, which is not the touching the ground. Gonna break, like, uh, if you go from the inside to the outside, like it's gonna all the way to the bottom is gonna be in the top. Maybe but, but yeah, but the break its half, don't break the OSB. Yeah. 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 And on the laying OSB. On the Unless you've got people. I think it is gonna be like that. He said, like, this. like we're gonna slide it up the thing, and then it, it's. Gonna have to be lifted a little bit over the tabs and then yeah. just popped on and slide. I thought, not popped on right. I thought we were gonna like use the ramp, never move the ramp, slide it up, slide it up, just keep beating teams on the ramp. Oh, no, no, I, I meant that abstractly. Like it, it's consider it's already up the ramp. We just move it over and then as we're leaning it up, you know, we can. Yeah, as, as you bring it up, you just have people on either side go this then. Yeah, that's what you need to have to have the tabs yeah. or yeah. anything you're resting on. Really. Probably. Well, the OSB is the key. I mean, the, uh, that yeah. everybody should always be on the lookout if somebody's going to lean it on. Because we're going to make mistakes or and yeah. get tired and stuff. Everybody should just be like, hey, hey, you're leaning against the OSB. That two inches is going to be more significant. Than passive yeah. trackers before? And also, let's be very, very attentive. So, it's like, super uh, hot. in slow, there's so a hot track. Under, there's uh, it's like a single uh, axis tracker. Oh, yeah, yeah. So then, yeah. Uh, sure it's done by an electric motor. A passive tracker, then, is the same idea you're trying to do the tracking. But yeah. they, they're yeah. doing yeah. it with a... Like a cylinder for uh, 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 chemical that then changes its density. Basically, I'll, I'll, I'll have 